Hello, and welcome to Good Grief, the podcast dedicated to demystifying and destigmatizing grief with compassion and humor. I'm Nikki. I'm an end of life doula and a grief coach in Columbus, Ohio. And today, I have a very special episode, another guest episode I'm so excited to share with you. (laughs) I had a nice, lovely conversation after some preceding conversations with Nicole. She is here in Columbus, Ohio with me. Nicole Havelka is the founder of Defy the Trend Coaching Community. She does burnout and exhaustion coaching. She also does individual coaching, yoga and meditation classes. She is just an all around super awesome person, but she also has been a clergy with United Church of Christ and has been through seminary and has a background in ministry. So with that, I wanted to have a conversation with her. I had a conversation with her in person a bit on grief and faith, which was so fascinating. And I told her, hey, I got this podcast. Would you like to be on it? She was very excited to do so. She even l- had listened to some of my episodes and told me how, she, you know, what resonated with her. My episode on what to say, what not to say, that old adage of it was God's will and things like that, and why people react so strongly to things like that. So I'm like a spoil anymore because we get into it in the episode and it's lovely. And Nicole is just such an awesome human being. I'm going to link her website and her information in the bio, but definitely check her out. She is quite a wonderful person, very dynamic and super fun to talk to. All right, without further ado, here's my conversation with Nicole Havelka. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. I have a very super special guest. Reverend Nicole is joining us today, and she's going to talk to us all about religion and theology, where it comes into play with grief. We had an awesome breakfast last week. Pancake balls are amazing. Uh, (laughs) We talked a bit about this, and I said, I'm going to get you on my podcast. We're going to talk about it more in depth. So here we are. Nicole, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Tell us just a little bit about, you know, what you do, where you are, and what we're going to talk about today. Hi there. I'm so delighted to be here. So thank you so much, Nikki, for having me on the podcast. Yeah, I'm Reverend Nicole Havelka. I'm an ordained clergy person in the United Church of Christ. And I've had a lot of non-traditional things you wouldn't associate with being clergy in that in that role. Um, I have been a chaplain to young people who with mental illness and behavioral disorders and a lot of loss, which relates to um, alert, relates, of course, to the topic of this podcast. I did that for a few years when I first started um, in ministry. I then spent more than a decade working with um, in the denominational level of the church. And so that meant that I did a lot of coaching training, leadership development, um, and various aspects. Um, particularly one of my subspecialties for a long time was with youth and young adults, um, working both with them directly, but also with the adults who, um, worked with them in their local churches doing training and, um, coaching, networking with them as well. But now I have a new, I'm an entrepreneur. I have a business that helps people um, and organizations recover from and prevent burnout called Defy the Trend. And so I'm mostly a coach and a trainer and a blogger and all of those sorts of things. So there's a lot of things that I do. And this is sort of a we just got, we were having a great conversation a few, uh, a week or so ago. And I was like, this would be fun to keep this conversation going. So I'm glad that you said yes. And that we get to have more of this conversation because I listened to part, some of your podcasts, uh, and I was like, oh yeah, that stuff annoys me too. Mm -hmm. Those things (laughs) people say around Mm -hmm. faith, uh, when people are dealing with grief and loss or, or particularly with or even with someone who is in the process of dying. Yeah. Well, yeah. let's start there. Cause that's, you perked my interest. And we were talking about that a little bit. Uh, Cause you listened to my episode on what to say, what not to say. And there's the old adage of it was all in God's plan or, well, God has another angel in heaven now. And I hate that because that makes, to me, that makes God seem like kind of a jerk that he would take away somebody, especially if it's a young person or God forbid a child, like, come on. So yeah. Give us your thoughts on that. Well, I, I think what might be helpful for us is to maybe take a step back and like unpack even what a statement like that would mean underneath it. 
Um, I mean, first of all, and I think you covered that in that podcast, which was the intent there is that that is a comfort, right? That that's going to be something that's comforting to people. The, the challenge is that that's not going to be everybody's belief system. And that might be comforting to some people. Mm-hmm. And it actually probably is, honestly. Yeah. But for many people, that's not going to be the case. Their beliefs are different. Even if you share the same, like, say, we're both Christian, people can be wildly different kinds of Christians, right? Ding, Um, ding. (laughs) I'm in a a progressive, a more progressive tradition of Mm -hmm. Christianity. And in some ways, like we we both believe in Jesus, but there's other kinds of other denominations, other faith traditions within Christianity that Mm -hmm. wouldn't look much. We wouldn't look much like each other. I mean, they wouldn't ordain someone with a female body like mine. Yep. Example. Like I wouldn't even be in the role that I am in some of those churches. Yeah. So I think though uh, it might go, might be helpful to unpack a little bit about what's underneath that. That's probably a person who, I mean, it's hard to say, but at minimum they're, they believe in God being a very omnipotent, all controlling God, mm-hmm. one that does lay out a plan for you. Um, and that's comforting. And for some people, that's very comforting mm-hmm. to say, okay, God has a purpose and a plan in this. But then I I know, like just from having been a human myself and knowing other people going through grief and loss, that that isn't helpful for them. Um, and that they may not believe it to begin with, or they may have believed it. And now they're like calling BS on it. Yeah. They're like, maybe, you know, like you, like you said, in the case of a child dying Mm -hmm. or something really tragic, like, or even a violent death or things like that, like how can God have a plan in what seems like horror Right. Right. Horrible tragedy. Right. I think there's different ways to re. there are many ways to rethink that. So even Mm -hmm. within the Christian tradition, which I'm most familiar with, and then side note, I'm also a yoga and meditation teacher. So I am a little familiar with that, um, with those Eastern philosophies as well, but I'm more formally trained in Christianity. Mm -hmm. So um, I I would say you don't have to believe in, in God's omnipotence in that particular Mm -hmm. way. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, you can see God as a God that is present. Mm-hmm. So uh, use another theological term, which is omnipresence, mm-hmm. which means that God is present in all of that. Mm-hmm. Doesn't necessarily promise to be around, you know, isn't moving us around like pieces on a chessboard. Thank you. Yep. God's a re- God is present in all of those things. Mm-hmm. Um You might even believe uh, kind of taking a step uh, beyond that or, uh, you know, around that. Yes, ending that idea by saying that perhaps another way of thinking about that is that God is there to transform that. Mm -hmm. Because I I know you work with people who are are in in grief or in different Mm -hmm. stages of grief and have grieved yourself. Mm -hmm. People often need to work through and yeah. create their own or a different narrative around that loss. Absolutely. And especially if it's a traumatic loss or a violent death or mm-hmm. something like a really, a really shocking one, they will need to find some sort of purpose for themselves in it. Yeah. That might radically change the trajectory of their life and they find some new purpose. I know that one of the things that comes to mind for me right now is that I've heard lots and lots of stories of people who have lost children or other loved ones to gun violence, channeling that into working for gun, you know, um, gun regulations and restrictions that they feel would help prevent that again. And so that gives them Mm -hmm. a place to channel that energy and that loss. Yes, absolutely. Um, And, and if you're thinking theologically about that, that is God transforming Mm -hmm. that loss. If you want to yeah. think about it that way, that is a way. Of, so that's a way of thinking about that with that. So you can have different theological lenses that yeah. aren't that. Right? Absolutely. And I feel like most people I know that are in my line of work or they either work as an end of life doula or some type of bereavement specialist. 90% of the people I've talked to that do this have done this because they went through something awful and they learned a lot from it and they want to help pass that on to the next person. I mean, that's full admission. That's why I do this. You know, I went through my series of losses. And um, I absolutely have gone through multiple crises of faith 
um, over my, over my history with, with the losses I've, and my, my thoughts, feelings, and interaction with religion has changed dramatically over the years because of those. I feel that's, and I feel that's totally normal. I've, you know, um, it was really hard for me to work through my brother's death. And I absolutely had a lot of, went through a lot of, there's no God, how could God do this? This is terrible. But yeah, it's that mindset of, you know, him being this omnipotent thing that we're just pawns and he's moving us around. And I don't like that. I don't like it. Right. And, (laughs) and I think the, in all of my years of working with young people and working with um, adults who worked with young people, I really, especially with the adults, I tried to equip them Mm -hmm. to have those harder conversations. It always makes me so sad to hear like particularly if they're young, but really at any age, if people are experiencing a loss and they don't have a, and, and if faith is part of their life and they don't have a person, a, a pastor or other trusted like friends and mentors within their faith tradition who can s- just be with them, who can mm-hmm. sit with them in that messy spot right. of I'm rethinking what I believe because of this experience. Mm-hmm. And that's okay, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, like, absolutely. For someone to just sit in the mess with them and say, okay, then how is this changing for you? Mm-hmm. Um, that would probably come a little after. It probably isn't in the immediate aftermath right. of the loss, but like months and years later mm-hmm. to continue to process that. And and mm-hmm. I see a lot of people, especially young people doing that without support. And that makes me so sad. Yeah. <laughs> well, or, or having the wrong support. Let's like, let's say you're a member of a church and you go to your clergy person and you're like, I'm really struggling with my faith right now because of this loss. And they negate all your feelings. And they're like, you just need to be strong. and God will take care of you. It's like, n- no, help me work through this. Don't just tell me God's going to make it all better. Like, help me, (laughs) you know? And that's, that's something so many people need. And I think they, not everybody's getting is that type of support from clergy too. For sure. And, and it just depends on how that person has been, been trained in, Mm -hmm. in their, and probably their own faith and belief systems Mm -hmm. too. It will depend on their theologies to some, right. Some degree as well. Um, And so that's, that's hard to know who's going to give you the those right answers and it doesn't have to be a clergy person either it may be just a wise elder or someone you respect or someone who's been through it and Mm -hmm. that may not even be someone who's older than you that might be someone who's younger but they've been through it younger for whatever reason um and so i think finding those people who you recognize is like well you know i know they've been through some stuff but they're still doing this faith thing maybe i should yeah maybe i should ask them so I, if you have, like unsatisfactory answers from one person, right? Like, go somewhere else. Yeah. Another. It's okay. Find another. Yeah. Or maybe that's in a different some of, I feel like some of the yeah. best spiritual advice I've received um, during, especially when I've been wrestling with faith has been from non-clergy members. Um, I mean, not saying I've had bad, I've had great clergy folks that I've, I've, t- I've spoken with. In fact, I went to a funeral for uh, an infant at my church uh, who died of SIDS. And it was the pastor of our church who gave the the sermon at the at the funeral. And he even said, like, I don't want to hear anybody say there's another angel in God's garden or this was God's will. I don't want to hear that from any of you because God wouldn't kill him. <laughs> like, he just went on this little rant about it. And I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> he yeah. had like a real love ahead about him with that. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's super important. So. Let's talk a little bit about um, we, you and I talked about this offline a little bit, people leaving faith or leaving religion because of loss. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Yeah. I mean, and you're, you're tapping into the thing that I used to teach and train on for like nearly a decade. I did that. That's (laughs) why I had you on the show. You're the expert here. (laughs) (laughs) I had to dig up some of my old, my old, my old stuff for my, just if it's my own experience. Right. Um, I, you know, and just, this was my own experience too. As a teenager, I left the Catholic church of my upbringing. Mm -hmm. So I was raised Roman Catholic. I left as a young adult, uh, not because I lost, um, you know, like uh, lost someone because of a death, but because my, I went to Catholic high school, like Catholic schools, my whole young life. Mm -hmm. And my high school was closed when I was a sophomore, and so, which is a huge loss, especially yeah. when you're 15. So, um, 
so it was result of a loss, just not a conventional loss, right? Yeah, that's still so, a loss. That's still a loss. loss. There's and still I grief there. How, exactly. Yeah. And it was so poorly handled. I, not by my teachers. The people yeah. who were in my immediate sphere were fantastic. The the upper echelon of, you know, like we asked for meetings with bishops and they wouldn't show up. Hmm. You know, like even and even if the decision is what it was, and now as an adult, I look back and I'm like, okay, it was an old building full of asbestos. It was not something that was financially feasible for them probably to upgrade. And there were 200 kids in a building built for 2000. Mm -hmm. It was, it was probably a good like financial decision to like close that one down and rebuild some new ones and other places that were healthier buildings. Like I could see that as a grown up. I could have even understood that as a 15 year old for that matter, but no one bothered to tell me that. That's probably why I spent so much time in in that, but that was what prompted me to leave. Like I had left uh, Roman Catholicism and said, I'd never go back to church again. God kind of laughed about that (laughs) and brought me back like in my mid twenties, mid to late twenties is when I went to seminary. That's a whole other story. We can have another podcast about that. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But there is like a prompt of, of loss and it need, you need to, it's at those moments when you need people. And I did have some people in retrospect who helped me with that, but they weren't my clergy person because I wasn't in church anymore. Um, it was friends. A lot of friends' parents helped me through that stage and helped me understand my faith in new ways. And then going to seminary will do it to you, rethinking. I, I bet. Well. Uh, I'm sure. You have to read. You have like <laughs> you, this. Literally, your job is to construct your theology at that point. So you have mm-hmm. to read you gain the skills both to do it in that moment. You have to confront the stuff in your past. Mm -hmm. But again, I think that's, I do see people leaving because of inadequate, um, just the people like not having enough wisened elders, right? Yeah. Um, Either the clergy person who's not equipped for whatever reason, or is equipped in a really particular way that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. I see that happening a lot. Um, And there's statistics about this. Um, I looked at the most recent Pew research before we got on here. And in the early 1990s, this is so interesting. And as as recently as the early 90s, 90% of people affiliated in the United States as Christian. That's the gamut of denominations and traditions within that. But that's affiliated to some kind of Christian now it's it's closer to 70 or even lower percent of people who affiliate as christian Mm -hmm. and of course the degree to which people affiliate is people might call themselves generically christian but maybe they Mm -hmm. don't actually have a faith community they're part of you know that can mean a lot of things within that umbrella Mm -hmm. and and so most of the people disaffiliating are christians because that's what dominated the united states for decades Mm -hmm. um and and so that's happening. And and I think, honestly, there's a whole lot of, re- there's a ton of research out there about why this is happening within that church world. But I, I always wondered if it, my big question was always, is it because they don't have, they don't have a faith tradition that can confront them in this, or can, confront is the wrong word, can be with them, can be present with them, like the God I believe in that's present, mm-hmm. present with you in those messy times in your life yeah and so again my advice would be like if the first person isn't the right person there are other people out there and it may not look like someone wearing a collar right you know a clergy collar it looks like someone else it can you know be your older uncle it can be your uncle it can be your yeah um it can be a friend it can be all kinds of people who can help you through that space in different ways yeah so, I'm yeah. interested to, I, and she sent me, I'm going to put link that article in the show notes for people listening. I'm curious to read it because I haven't had a chance to read it yet um, about that. But also, do you feel like uh, another, and I try really hard to keep politics out of my podcast and also religion, but th- this whole episode I'm very excited about, but um, do you feel like people, um, I work with a lot of LGBTQ plus community and there's a lot of grief surrounding that from people who are ostracized from their family, basically kicked out of their family. And then a lot of that is because of religious beliefs. Um, And that's a huge, a huge like point of grief for everybody on both sides. I'm sure that the family members are sad because they're losing their child in their way, but you know, even though they made that choice to remove them from their life, but 
Do you feel like that? I don't know if that was in that article, but do you feel like that's something that's kind of pushing people away too? I mean, I, I mean, I definitely see that anecdotally. I, I don't know that I have seen specific research on that, although there mm-hmm. might be. Um, it's worth some Googling, I think, on yeah. that. Oh. I, I know as a being part of a denomination that does welcome LGBTQ um, individuals into, you know, welcomes them with open arms mm-hmm. with different degrees of success, by the way. I wouldn't say that we're right. like, let me be clear, not all United Church of Christ, no one is going to do that perfectly because we're not perfect. Right. But uh, I would say even the ones that are, they're all living into mm-hmm. being welcoming and, and and are on different stages of that journey. I'll yeah. just say that. <laughs> to yeah. be generous. I'm being generous. That's how they are in that journey. Yeah. I definitely think that, I mean, because the United Church of Christ gets tons of um, people of all kinds of ages, really, mm-hmm. who have come out um or even even if they're straight like just can't abide by that belief Mm -hmm. in their tradition that does get named in the the one of the interviews they did i don't know if i'd have to google that i would like to know any further research on that specifically but i just know that we the united church of christ sees tons of people Mm -hmm. who have been who have been damaged LGBTQ yeah. folks who have been damaged because of being ostracized or even if it's not being fully kicked out, like just mm-hmm. not feeling like they're welcome anymore. Yeah. Right. It, it can take varying. It can, it can yeah. take a lot of shades of there's a yeah. lot of different shades of how that ends up happening. So I absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely know that anecdotally. And those folks have a lot of I, I mean, I would call it spiritual trauma to work out. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Almost, almost everybody I've spoken to has had, even non LGBTQ community Mm -hmm. have had some serious trauma around religious upbringings. Um, And that's, again, just CYA. I'm not pooping on anybody's religious beliefs whatsoever. You know, everybody's entitled to have their beliefs, but um, I'm just talking about grief in general. Um, Yeah. yeah, But thank you for bringing that up about UCC, because I I go to a Methodist church Mm -hmm. and um, I grew up in a Methodist church and the Methodist church as a whole has still denounced homosexuality, which I pisses me off, pardon my French, to no end. But every UMC church I have been to, at least in Columbus, Ohio, is like, no, no, that's fine. Anybody can come here. You can have your wedding here. We don't care. And I love that. So put that plug well, in and that it. church is splitting <laughs> right now over that very issue really yeah interesting okay there was a vote taken the anyway i i'm not the person to talk about that okay I'm united methodist <laughs> yeah. but just in this past year there's been a vote taken and and the end result is that most of what's happening is that more conservative pastors and churches are are leaving yeah and okay. That will probably change in the broader United Methodist Church in the next yeah. several years. Very likely. But they're I know. disaffiliating and creating their own denomination or being independent, one or yeah. the other. The last time that was voted on, the very next Sunday, my pastor came into church and said, I don't care. I'm not going to let, they can take my robe. They can have it. If you, you know, I accept everybody here. So I love that. Yeah. He's yeah. a great man. Uh, <laughs> okay. And enough of that. We don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. Um So let's talk a little bit about faith with grief. So if you were to have somebody, and I know you're not like fully practicing clergy person anymore, but put your clergy hat on for a second. If you had somebody coming to you with that crisis of faith, we talked a little bit about this already, but they're just like, I, like I lost my wife to an overdose. You know, she had an addiction and now she's gone and this is awful. And I can't believe God would allow this to happen. Like Mm. what type of things would you, would you say, like, how would somebody in your position or a clergy person best handle that situation? I mean, I think like shutting up and listening is really your best tactic. It also depends. It also depends on where people are in the journey, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so uh, if that person just had that loss, I definitely would be quiet. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that a lot of at least mainline Protestant clergy and Catholic clergy will have to do is something called clinical pastoral education. And it's often done as at least one unit. And one unit has a certain number of hours in it. I forget how many Mm -hmm. of 
uh, it often takes the form of a hospital chaplaincy. Okay. Um, but it can be done in other settings as well. It depends. Um, I did mine in a hospital setting. Um, and so you essentially become a chaplain intern. And, and one of the things that you learn in that, and it's really hard for people like us in our culture Mm -hmm. is to simply learn how to sit in the discomfort of people's losses. I would imagine that folks in your line of work do training around this too, yep. because our instinct is to be, is to fix it. Yep. Or to yep. make it go away because we're uncomfortable with people's strong emotions in general mm-hmm. and per- grief in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, so you learn to just sit and be with people in the in the thick of it, especially in the case of a hospital chaplain. So you're getting people right when they're experiencing the loss. Um, so you're getting them in the minute if you're on call yeah. in that particular moment. Mm-hmm. So you learn how to do that and you unlearn that instinct to say, oh, I can do this to make it better. I can do this to make it better. I can do this to make it better because you, you don't have the power to make that better or change anything right. about that situation. What I can signal to you, particularly if I'm that person in the hospital and I'm the chaplain and I'm representing in some ways, this is uncomfortable to me still, even almost 20 years later, that I'm representing God for you in a way in that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and that feels like a big burden, but it's also a privilege like mm-hmm. that I get to be that. And if I can be that person who's present to you in that space hopefully it plants the seed at minimum (laughs) that, oh, there is a God somewhere that's present to me yeah, without judgment, without trying to fix me or change me in this moment. Now, if someone's wanting to process that (laughs) long-term months or even years after the fact, and they're still struggling Mm -hmm. with their faith in some way, that's when I might start asking some probing questions about what's underneath that. So then I might start asking things like, Okay, so you you don't believe that that God, you know, put another angel in heaven, you know, so, you know, that your loss created this angel in heaven, or you don't want to believe that God is moving us around like, you know, pawns on a chessboard mm-hmm. to um, uh, and created and made this death or even some people will go as far as saying, oh, well, this I mean, or they say it without maybe even meaning it like, oh, if this if God intended this for some purpose, then this is some kind of sick test that they're giving you in this loss. Yeah. Um, Well, that's not the God I believe in, by the way. Me neither. (laughs) Um, I know one of this, and this comes from one of my good friends, who's also a clergy person. And they, if people will say I'm an atheist, um, they will ask them, the person saying that. So tell me about this God that you don't believe in. And so they they'll say, okay, I don't believe in a God that's all controlling in that in that situation where we might be dealing with a loss that okay. would cause my eight-year-old sister to die when I was when they were so young, like that they would cause that. And then my friend would always say, Well, I don't believe in that God either. Like that. Yeah. And it's brilliant. My friend Alice said that, not me. Um, I just think it's a brilliant line. But those kinds of probing questions. Like, um, and then, okay, unpacking, like, okay, you, you don't like, and I had to do this in seminary. You're like, I knew I was really good at saying what I didn't believe, but I was terrible at saying what I did believe. And it's a lot harder to make that jump. You can be really clear about like that crap over there is not what I believe, but this is what I, Yeah. it's harder to, you can, you eventually get there, but then to reconstruct, okay, I don't believe that God is moving us around. So what, how does God and God's energy work in the world? Mm -hmm. And then that provides an opportunity to talk about that. Then how does, how might that work then for, and you coming to some understanding of that in conversation with your own faith tradition, because your own faith tradition, whether it's Christianity or something else is far more diverse than whatever one little piece of it you got exposed to as a young person, Mm -hmm. unless you went to a lot of different churches or synagogues or mosques or whatever. Like the reality is like what you got was this much of the entire tradition. And I bet if you read, like if you're a heady type person and wanted to read all kinds of theology, like, Oh my gosh, I can, give you libraries full of books that would help you think more about that. We can ask questions about that. Um, 
you know, I'm a yoga and meditation practitioner and someone who likes contemplative practice as well. Like if you're that kind of person, like what if you feel into it? Mm -hmm. What if we practice into this rather than thinking our way out of it? Again, different people like will, will respond to different things depending on the person I'm who's sitting next to me, right? Yeah. But I honestly love that space that people are in. Mm -hmm. That sounds super weird, but <laughs> I actually love, uh, and this is part of why I love yoga and meditation as well, is that it's an invitation to sit in the discomfort. Yeah. Once I, I got over my need to fix it, yeah, like just sitting in it is actually so exciting and in, in a mm -hmm. trans being with people in a transforming space like that you're talking to somebody really who likes awesome i mean you're talking <laughs> to somebody who enjoys sitting with people while they're dying so yeah, totally. enjoy is a harsh word but it's so energizing and fulfilling to be in such an intimate space with somebody in such a transitional moment so i get what you're saying <laughs> yeah. i hope yeah. other people do too it's yeah, it's an absolute honor. And like, I'll just say that, like, you can find me on my website, which we'll talk about later. But I'm always happy to have a cup of coffee or tea around this question. So. Yeah, good. <laughs> like, and I, don't, I don't mind that at all. And then you might see me show up at some of Nikki. I'm in Columbus, Ohio as well. So yeah. I might show up at some of your yeah. um, uh, death cafes and other things that you offer as well. Please do. Um, I love that. And I love hearing different viewpoints because I'm a, one of the first death cafes I had, I had a woman with me who had a very, not strict, but very, not even, she wasn't Orthodox Jewish, but she had a very religious Jewish upbringing. And she's much, much older now. And she's like really thinking a lot about her imminent death because she's getting close to 90. And um, I've had uh, in the same group, there were people that were really strong, devout Christians too. And nobody was argumentative. Nobody was like, like weird about it. We just had the most, I had a, a I think that same meeting, I had a woman who was Hindu and, um, yeah, she, and she was talking a bit about like reincarnation and she, she didn't quite believe in that, but we had the most stunning conversations around beliefs with death and dying and nobody got upset. Nobody got angry. Nobody said anybody was wrong. We were all just excited to learn about different beliefs. And I love that. I love learning about different religions and different people's thoughts around this. Yeah. I mean, I could learn about that because what I know about, you know, uh, religious practices around dying um, in traditions other than my own is is pretty limited. Like even as, you know, someone who's been around a while and have certainly had lots of interfaith conversations but i don't know that i've had that particular mm -hmm. that particular one very often oh it was really cool i highly yeah. recommend it yeah. uh yeah and anybody listening find a death cafe in your area there's virtual ones too there's they have them online all the time because it's you will just hear some of the coolest stuff from all a huge diverse group of individuals so um, okay, we are getting nearer to the end of the episode, but before I pull out the death deck, which my listeners know of, um, is there anything else you'd like to share that you, because I know you said you did some research ahead of time, you've been doing some reading uh, on grief and faith and anything on this topic? Something that stuck out, you're like, ooh, no? I don't think I have anything new. I just want to remind folks that, like, keep keep asking questions. Like, just keep asking your questions it's not wrong. It's not bad. It's, it's actually a part of faith. Like we tend to think because we like to think in black and white in our culture, mm -hmm. like that, that doubt and faith are these opposites. And I mm -hmm. actually think they're sort of yes. necessarily intertwined. Like, I don't think faith exists without doubt. Totally um, agree. Uh, a friend and I were just texting about this um, recently that I, I don't actually think the opposite of faith is doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. Ooh. Um, we're, we're building on this theory, by the way, okay. we're, or stay tuned. We might have more, but like we were just texting another clergy person and I were texting about this. So I, I actually think doubt is a really, and the, mm -hmm. we, you could even call doubt a practice that it's something we continue to practice because there's never there's never been a time in my life, I don't think, and especially not since I went to seminary and did all of that stuff that mm -hmm. I've, I've been, well, nothing that I believe has stayed completely the same. Oh, yeah. It is continued it? to evolve. Yeah. 
I mean, other than other than the understanding that there is like that, I believe there is some sort of higher power um, at work in the universe Mm -hmm. that doesn't change. But then how that evolves and change my in the case of Christianity, how my understanding of of Jesus and how I live as a Jesus follower changes all the time. Um, because I've studied yoga and meditation, um, as well, like how does that interact with my understanding of my Christianity and then vice versa? Like Mm -hmm. that is so rich and I wouldn't turn, like, I wouldn't give that journey up. And so if you think that you're like failing at faith because like, you're not certain, I, Mm -hmm. I would say that you're actually successful at faith because you're not certain. Yeah. Oh, I love that part of the journey. Like it's fun. Yeah. My, one of my, I, I'm a musical nerd. I went to school for theater. A lot of my listeners know that. Um, my, one of my favorite lines in a musical is from the original prologue of Godspell where the philosophers are all singing and they do this cacophonous thing. But one of the philosophers has a line at the end of his, his, uh, phrase of, I can't believe that God designed a human being with a mind he's not supposed to use. I love that. That's just a perfect, yeah. concise way of saying, and I believe that too. Like, why would we have free will, and why would we have these complex thoughts and minds if we're just supposed, just supposed to blindly ignore that and follow this one straight path? So, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sure. You're welcome. Awesome. All right. Well, now is the time where I'm going to pull a card at random from the death deck. So let's see what we got. Uh oh oh, I like this because I have a fun story to go with this, but. Have you ever seen someone's cremated remains outside of the urn? <laughs> That's no. a weird question. No, because again, no. having been raised Roman Catholic, cremation isn't very frequent. Oh. Okay. In in that tradition. So I don't know that I've seen cremated cremated remains in an urn. Other than on TV and movies. Yeah. Strangely enough. Um, I've seen lots of dead bodies because of working in the hospital. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And I've seen lots of prepared bodies and caskets, but I've, I don't think I've even seen cremated remains. It's, it's interesting. So, and yeah, like most people, a lot of people haven't seen them and maybe you have, maybe some people have, but uh, it's one of those, they give it to you and you're just like, I'm just going to not touch this again. Um, so um, I had my, my cat died a couple years ago. She's my best friend. She was almost 20 and, um, I had her cremated and they brought me her ashes and I immediately opened that box. I wanted to see, <laughs> but here's what got me when she, when the, the vet came to our house to uh, put her down and, um, you know, he took her away in this little basket. And I said, she had this toy that she had had her entire flipping life. This ratty, nasty little toy was like 20 years old. It was like matted fabric at this point but it, it had a little like plastic ball in it because it would shake it was like a rattle and uh I was like I would like this cremated with her it was her favorite thing she always slept with it and he said no problem so I was just morbidly curious and I was looking at the ashes in the bag and um I saw that little plastic ball from her toy I was like, I was looking, I know. And I had heard, cause okay, I'm weird. I'm morbid, whatever. I kind of just wanted to see what they look like. And I had heard sometimes you might see bone fragments and there were, there were totally bone fragments. Usually they shake those up so that you don't have that. And it's just a powder. Um, mm-hmm. But there were a couple bone fragments. I was like, what is that little ball? And then I like kind of poked it through the bag and I realized it was a little plastic ball from her toy <laughs> and I couldn't believe it didn't melt or whatever. I was just like, and I just bawled because then I'm like, this is definitely her ashes. This is my baby. <laughs> I just love to share that story. I anyway. Well, um, I will tell you cremated remains are not what they look like in the movies all the time. If they oh, do a I'm good sure job, if they do a good job, it should just be powder. But sometimes they bone fragments get left in there. So now, right. you know. All right, Nicole, thank you. I'm now going to give you some time to just talk about your business now, what you do and where my listeners can find you. Sure. Thank you so much for that. So again, I'm Nicole Havelka. I'm in Columbus, Ohio, but I serve coaching clients all over the United States or any English speaking country. If we could figure out the time zone, I'm willing to, the time difference, I'm willing to do that. Um, I coach and uh, I have founded a group coaching community, in fact, around burnout. So helping people who have um, burnout from work or other things, you can be burnout from things besides work. 
And uh, you can find more about me um, doing that work around prevention and recovery from burnout at defythetrend.com. You can also find me by my name at, on LinkedIn. Um, Nicole Havelka Consulting is where you find me on Facebook. Those are the two places I'm I'm probably most active. And then we I have a private online community as well that you can sign up for that's on my website. Um, there's a free version of that um, that you can start with as well. So those are probably the best places, but I still do lope around inter- Instagram every once in a while as Rev N Havelka. Um, I'm still there periodically, um, but that's about where I'm at online these days. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I I loved this. This was great. And I'm super excited for my listeners to hear this when I put it out there. Um, Cause I think I, I love having uncomfortable conversations about death and dying and having this conversation about religion and faith with grief was so important. So I hope everybody enjoys this. All right. Thank you so much. Another huge thank you to Nicole for coming on to my podcast and being so open to have these brave conversations that so many of us are afraid to have. And that's the whole point of my podcast is getting past that anxiety and just talking about these things and having these difficult conversations. Okay. Thank you again so much for tuning in. Again, I will link Nicole's information in the description. So please check that out. Please check out her website. You can access her coaching. You can do like a free trial and see if it's right for you. And yeah, definitely check it out. She has some great stuff on there. So thank you again for tuning in. If you really liked this episode, please tell your friends about it. That'd be nice. Maybe rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. That'd be really nice. What would be super awesome nice would be if you would become a patron of mine on Patreon. If <laughs> you go to patreon.com slash Nikki the Death Doula, you'll get twice weekly grief affirmations. You get early access to this podcast a week early and ad free. Not that there's ads on it right now anyway, but you can get the video of my conversation with Nicole today or video of the conversations from previous guests I've had on my podcast. So yeah, please, I would appreciate it. With the money I get from my Patreon, I use that to continue to provide pro bono work for people within my own community. Okay? Okay. You can find me on all the socials. I'm Nikki the Death Doula, and you can find my website, NikkiTheDeathDoula.com. I would love to hear from you if you have a thought on an episode, if you'd like to be a guest on my show. Or if you have a topic idea, just shoot it my way. Always happy to hear from you. All right, everybody, have a wonderful week. And remember, as always, your grief is yours. Your feelings are valid. And grief doesn't always have to suck. Bye.